This lecture is titled Mosaic Patterns, Module 2, in which we would offer concluding remarks in terms of various layers of discussion we have conducted in the last few lectures. The lecture itself is divided into three parts. First, we would offer concluding remarks by establishing connections between various lectures. Part 2 will deal with post-colonial buildings Roman and beyond. Part 3 would offer new voices. Let us first of all look at the outline of module 2 in order to have clarity about our attempt to bring various strands of writers on writing. This particular module as we had stated right at the outset was actually centered on the writer's vocation and also the cultural demands, changing cultural demands on the writer. The rationale behind that open ended starting point was related to the, our attempt to let you explore many possibilities they may be mythic, historical or cinematic, but various images of the writer were evoked and the idea was again to let you really freely explore your own viewpoint. The teacher's personal connection to the writing process was also shared to establish better dialogue, because as we acknowledge right at the outset that the kind of course that we have presented to you, th there is not too much of that tradition of offering creative writing courses within the university set up and therefore, uh, I wanted to establish the rationale for offering such a course both in academic terms and in terms of the creative impulse of the teacher concerned also. The sec next lecture in which we talked about creativity, uh, creativity and writing etcetera. Uh, this sort of was meant to enlarge the framework of our discussion uh, regarding creativity issues, because there is constant research in this area and we wanted you to be familiar with the research and some of the practice in different countries, so that you can choose the ideas that appeal to you most. You are also aware of how different people conduct these activities and finally, you are able to arrive at your own point of view. Again, I emphasize that time and again because there is certainly no desire to develop any imitative mold, but it is important to see what is happening in the rest of the world. So, the third lecture in this part actually also carried forward the same idea, but what we did is to evaluate various famous manuals on writing and we offered you insights from these manuals and in the process we evaluated and critiqued them, so that again you have some idea about what we value and what we do not value but we also encouraged you to read these manuals on your own, so that you can decide whether what we left out was indeed what you also wanted to leave out. The fourth lecture of this module, it revolved around writers on writing and in the next four lectures, what we try to do is to share the classroom work that was done while teaching this elective in IIT Bombay. The elective was offered at the fourth year level as I had, I have indicated earlier and it also actually was more of a spontaneous process because I had a structure and I de definitely had a plan of action, but very often the students also had questions which, which I added on. So, all these are shared and the two writers that I have presented in this segment are writers whose work we studied in the kind of framework I have provided here, which is somewhat different from the traditional way of teaching literature, 
because here we actually started with the writers on writing and we looked at Camus literary notebook where he separates it from autobiographical writing. So, it was felt that you know this offered a way of helping the student understand the demands of the literary process which is not purely an autobiographical process. It of course, has elements of the autobiographical aspects of our lives, but at the same time writers undertake an imaginative journey where distancing is also a very important part and of course, this is a generalization, but I think for people who are beginning to write this is a very important consideration. And therefore, we looked at the literary notebook and also we encouraged interrelated reading that is reading of the literary notebook along with the creative work of that particular writer. Similarly, we went on to look at Atwood and her notion of the writer's self. In the case of Camus, the notion of the self offered by Camus was somewhat different because he was interested in looking at the self looking at oneself. Uh, and also he did not have a sense of split that Atwood talks about, whereas Atwood feels that the writer has the other self. And of course, we looked at couple of essays and we also tried to unpack her elusive essays so that we could uh, respond to the content in a deeper manner. So, this was uh, an exercise in reading, but reading which is targeted towards the writing process. And we also gave you samples from the work that the students had undertaken, so that you can see, you can yourself see that none of these are really out of reach because sometimes when you are not exposed to literary discourses, you can feel very daunted by the material that is presented before you. I have really tried very hard to demystify and also kind you know take care of uh, let us say conceptual and theoretical issues, but at the same time I have tried to offer it in a way that they become com comprehensible to people who may not have in depth awareness of the discourses. It may therefore, then happen that those who have in depth uh, awareness of these discourses, they may feel that many of the issues are missing, but I think I have tried uh, very hard not to even allow that kind of feeling to slip in. So, it is a blend of sometimes intellectually sharper theoretical analysis, but often the you know whole attempt is to make the material accessible and encourage you to read, enjoy and learn from these deep insights offered by great professional writers of our time. The other aspect that is actually very close to my heart is related to our presentations on Indian writing and very, very consciously we started with writers and narrators because often times in our oral tradition which has its own political dimensions, uh, we find that there are such capable and sophisticated narrators who are really not designated as writers. But it also has another side to it, uh, which is related to the fact that there is this collective sharing of stories, myths, legends and that also enriches our context a great deal. So, I sort of felt a strong need to make sure that the notion of the narrator is also placed before you for your own assessment. And therefore, we started with this notion of the writer and the narrator, but of course, you know we have pitched it within the framework of folk plays and folk tales 
it does not mean that a novelist is not a narrator or a writer whose writing is not a narrator. He, the writer is also a narrator, but a narrator within the oral tradition has a very, very different dynamics and I think there are issues that need to be addressed here also and I leave it to you to do so. The other aspect of this presentation is related to the take, our take on contemporary Indian writers and their search for creativity in the post-colonial perspective. So, what has been done here is to look at the number of uh, great examples and of course, you know I would not go into these examples very much, but we have emphasized this element of search which I will uh, also briefly describe later on, but uh, what I have also tried to do is to place it within the historical context, so that we can see the differences between the nationalist period and writers and thinkers of that period and what writers are doing today. And this is not to build any hierarchy, but to try and understand the historical dynamics of change and also the resultant uh, you know forms and themes that have developed. So, uh, two lectures are devoted to that and of course, the final lecture is the lecture where I am trying to tie everything together, but what I have done is to advance some of our ideas from this post colonial period, which is a very, very rich period and so let me talk about that in some detail. Uh, I have placed the notion of the Bildung's Roman here once again, primarily because we are interested in this yeah, young writers who are also dealing with their evolving sense of the self. And Bildung's Roman from that point of view is a very, very useful framework for discussion, but I certainly do not want to stay with Bildung's Roman, but it has influenced the choice of material in terms of at least the uh, initial uh, post colonial uh, you know period the memoirs that we have chosen the essays that we have chosen but at the same time uh, we will also see what this bildung's roman is so that once again you are clear about it the, the reason i place bildung's roman within post -colonial, colonial is because as i said it has the, uh, structurally this element of search which you find not only within the post-colonial uh, Bildung's Roman, but also Bildung's Roman in the European context. It is a form with close formal connections to biography, memoir, cinematic form. There are other similar genres which right now we would not look at, but you can later on uh, dip into it in order to pick and choose. What again is fascinating about this form is the fact that it deals with the protagonist's development from childhood to youth and the quest for identity is a dominant theme and it is often shaped by overcoming various ordeals and therefore, you know you begin to understand the kind of changes that are internalized by the character. So, in that sense it is a fascinating form. And Therefore, you will see once again that we picked up the memoirs of uh, thinkers and writers like Tagore, Gandhi and Nehru, although that was an ambitious ex exercise considering we you know clubbed them together for just one lecture. But the idea is that you would begin to think about these writers and their viewpoint, their writing and also read them in depth. But what we added here is the issue of post colonial period, which is defined by the introduction of English language, western science and democracy and the kind of tussles that ensued, because India is a pluralistic society and there are a number of indigenous systems of thought that coexist. So, the kind of tussles that ensued, this is what we have focused on, uh, but we have also confined ourselves to these three great thinkers and writers of the nationalist period. 
what we would like you to do is to move on to another notable period which we have not touched on except briefly in module 1 is the period of 1980s and 1990s especially for fiction. Uh, Salman Rushdie's Midnight's Children I think uh, in that sense is also seen as a post-colonial buildings roman but it's not just that it's much more than that but I've given that key idea here so that you have an entry point for that very complicated fantasy. Uh, it's a comic epic you can start with that key point and also you can contrast it with Arundhati Roy's God of Small Things which is seen as a tragic epic. As I said these are not the labels that define the work completely but in terms of Bildung's Roman and in terms of construction of identity under pluralistic systems I think it does give you very deep insight which is the role of fiction. It uh, really engages with spaces that are left out from analytical framework. We would also actually like to develop better understanding of what the writers of this particular period have to say about scientific issues because we notice that Tagore engaged with scientific issues because English language, science and democracy these were three ideas that gripped the imagination and it was these three were seen as important elements of decolonization process. So, we would like you to look at Grimus which is a book which he of course uh, does not think very highly of himself, but I think we should need to look at it all over again especially because of its SF nature. Arundhati Roy's of course book I have already mentioned uh, the novel, but also political essays such as the end of imagination. What we notice here is that s some of the writers have actually not necessarily uh, you know engaged with scientific issues in terms of their fiction, but I think it is interesting to note that all three of uh, these important writers have handled the issues of science and technology in their own way by critiquing our society, our country and our national policies related to science and technology. Uh, Amitav Ghosh's The Calcutta Chromosome, The Hungry Tide I think both need to be also looked at very carefully uh, both for their you know aesthetic value, their significance, but also for science and nature related uh, ideas that have been internalized and expressed and explored. And also the essay on nuclear science policy titled Countdown. So, this is by and large more of a reading list, but we definitely want you to carry forward whatever arguments we have presented before you by connecting it to a recent uh, framework and then bring it to your own immediate surroundings. We also actually have been fascinated by the kind of impact that popular fiction like Chetan Bhagat's five point someone has had on a large number of our students. Uh, many, many students who actually were not readers of fiction in English have started reading it after Chetan Bhagat's five point someone, which is rather interesting phenomenon because Chetan Bhagat does look at the underbelly of this highly idolized uh, engineering education system and the syndrome that is that it represents and also we have discussed it earlier in relationship to the film Three Idiots. Although this is in the realm of popular fiction and uh, you know popular cinema, but I think both deserve a careful look and as also social phenomenon. We would like you to contrast Chetan Bhagat's piece especially a small segment in terms of what Gandhiji said about machines while in conversation with Mahadev Desai. This particular part where there is a parody of the teacher is extremely popular amongst the students and I suppose I know why. But I think I would like you to have a look at it and also enjoy the contrast, but also think about the kind of contrast where Chetan Bhagat's teacher uh, Mr. Professor Dubey 
uh, in the novel, he is interested in celebrating machines, he is teaching mechanical engineering and he says, fall in love with the world around you, Mr. Professor Dubey, smile for the first time and I am reading from the text, for you will become the masters of machines. So, certainly a very, very different point, point of view from the one that Gandhiji raised in terms of a, a sort of sense of philosophical investigation of what it means to think of machines and I think both from biological systems uh, that is biological human destiny to the destiny of the nation. I think Gandhiji had a seamless sense of connection whereas here the language is entirely different and unfortunately this does not really work out as you will discover in the novel. So, I think we need to look at popular fiction of this kind also uh, with uh, you know great seriousness and also see why more and more people are reading this because this is not a simple case of acceptance of a given system, but a way of actually also trying to critique it and understand its complications. Uh, finally, I want to let you know that we are also searching for new writers when we talk about our interest in how the whole issue of English language and scientific uh, western scientific knowledge versus indigenous models etcetera became a key element of decolonization. We have also been searching for writers and one of the writers who gripped our attention is actually uh, Izar Asar uh, whose actually obituary introduced us ironically to his work. And I, I would not sort of read this whole thing, but you know he died a writer whose work was hardly noticed and it is very much uh, sadly in the Piazza mold where the writer in the garret struggled against the world because uh, although he was full of uh, talent and also you know great deal of intellectual curiosity, but somehow uh, despite his participation in the uh, you know progressive writers association and also his prolific uh, writing career, I think somehow uh, except those who read Urdu, I think the work has not reached us. So, let me place the work that uh, was actually mentioned. As I said, this was in the obituary that Seema Chishti wrote and I am very thankful for her, you know, for this write up because it woke me up to what different people have been doing. I have been investigating this science and literature connection for a very long time and it was very, very touching to read this whole profile. But in terms of the work that he published, uh, the first science fiction novel that he published was Adhi Zindagi. Uh, then he went on to publish a landmark collection of science stories and poems called La Sharik, which means the non participant. And then his other novel is called Mashino ki Bhagavat, written in 1953. I just want to place these remarks here from uh, again Chishti's interview, where I think. Uh, Mumtaz Rizvi, one of the commentators recalled that Asar was so far ahead of his time and so sure of being so that when he wrote a poem called Dinosaur 50 years ago, he noted that people would not understand it just then. And again you know in terms of this lack of recognition that I just talked about, his family was very sort of I think. Uh, how very passive in some ways and also in some ways reconciled to the fact that he had such a tough life where his work was never recognized. He wanted to be read, he published, he was not in Kafka mold, he was more in the Camus mold and he wanted to be read. But after his death, his family talked about his marginality and this is what they had to say. And as I said, it really moves me each time I read this, uh, he says, being a people acquainted with facts and fiction, 
we know how people in India treat their writers, not just in Urdu, but also those who write in Hindi, Punjabi and any other language but English. So it is all right, said a member of the family, Riley. Finally, our interest is in generating discussion and creative work on the ways science and technology has pervaded our lives. This is one of the themes that runs through our attempt and not because we are placed in the IIT setup, but because we are placed in a world where science and technology has really begun to make very deep inroads in our lives and in our consciousness. And therefore, we want to see this pervasive and powerful impact of science as an ambiguous sign of rationality and progress. We want to deliberate on or discuss contrasting views and ideologies of science, technology and social value. Also continuities and discontinuities of the discourse that actually during the Swadeshi period when Gandhiji wrote Hind Swaraj uh, posited the indigenous versus the non-indigenous in a very sharp manner. We want to see the continuities and discontinuities of that discourse and we want you to arrive at your own conclusions. We do not really have set conclusions to offer you. Finally, we are committed to new voices and new themes and therefore, I would like to say that our emphasis is on you and your voices. We are really not con confining ourselves to only one single possibility, although we have our own choices and our own interests uh, in different kinds of voices. But I think we would like you to explore your own voice as clearly as possible. Uh, in that connection, I think it is very, very important to place Rob Pope's quotation of E. M. Foster at the center of your attempts. And this is really a very uh, problematic area because as I said often when you, are, you become a reader, you are daunted by the reading process, but writing process is a different kind of activity. So, the separation has to be worked out by you. This is what Rob Pope has mentioned. Look before you leap is criticism's motto. Leap before you look is creativity's. So, I think when I was looking at this and looking at the demands that it places, I was reminded of Kabir's words uh, where, when he says, Jin dhunda tinapaiya gehre pani pat, mai bora budan dara raha kinare bat. So, basically, take a plunge, and in fact, we encourage some of our students to take this plunge and we offer some of the new voices in terms of what our students have been writing on their own. Uh, they have not been coached or schooled, but they agreed to share their writing. We are very thankful for that and that is a section where I think I will leave it to uh, the students to present their work to you. I would like to introduce Smita Pendharkar. You, ma you have seen her in lecture one of the second module when she read out the part of Simone de Beauvoir, I would say so very well. Uh, in this uh, sort of segment, I have asked her, coaxed her rather, to read her creative piece. Uh, after her interaction with her last time, I slowly discovered many aspects of her research and creative work both. In her own words, she wants to be described as a student of sociology, a social activist and a poet who writes primarily on the travails and boons of her diasporic identity. A life passed between three countries, Tanzania, the United States and India has been and continues to be the central subject of her poetry and prose. So here is Smita. A feminist in pieces. I am a feminist in pieces with a thousand grains of life scattered over three continents. I have no real home nor a sense of belonging. 
The voices around me often say that I am living in three diasporas, breathing in three cultures, communicating in three distinct idioms. I often feel less like a citizen of the world and more like a nomad of the imaginary, traversing a terrain and incessant borders that exist only for me. With roots that barely grip the earth I stand on and a voice that seldom resonates with the souls around me, I am a walking contradiction belonging to no particular world, to no particular continental womb. I am a feminist in pieces, born of a black mother miles and miles away, birthed of a culture that celebrates color, rhythm and unity. I am weaved into a brilliant quilt of reds, blacks, golds, and greens. I have stood with my fist clenched in revolution against police brutality for taking back the night and towards building a stronger nation. But in the end, I have always stood alone at the crossroads of this deeply matrixed life and wondered about which one leads home. I am a feminist in pieces fighting for the rights of my sisters. With a head wrap as my crown and a body studded with symbols of my history, I have taken more than one journey towards the light, towards the freedom that my sisters and I sought in honor of Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, Asata Shakur, and Angela Davis. Still tied to my mother's umbilical cord, I walked tall knowing that I was black, African, beautiful, and destined to fulfill the dream. I walked tall, black, African, and beautiful, or did I? Struggling to hold myself together, bursting at the seams with black pride, American patriotism, and an indescribable Indianness, I'm a cocktail for which there is no recipe. The voices inside me say that I am less a rooted revolutionary and more the seasonal pollen that floats above the fields. Settling wherever the gentle and furious winds take me, I belong to no one place, no one culture, no one ideology. I am an alien wherever I go simply because the soil that I hover above never takes my roots, never beckons to me, never embraces me. I am a feminist in pieces asking questions for which there are no real answers, breathing movements of which I am never really a part of because they say I am seated by birth at the top of the social hierarchy, a heathen of sorts because of my Brahminism, an oppressor because I have light skin and Aryan-esque features, a perpetrator of violence against the invisible masses because I own much more than a shack situated on the banks of a polluted city. A feminist in pieces, my voice suffers a spiritual and moral laryngitis, consumed by a guilt that I understand but will not own. Bothered by the social infection of poverty and, and oppression, I have cared for and cared about those who have laid blame squarely on the shoulders of my ancestors and I. My sense of conviction and pride, rickety from accusations, tremulous under the rage of the benighted beasts of my castocracy, and erratic in the presence of contention, are reduced to that guilt that I understand but will not own, will not wear, that guilt I understand but cannot feel. The broken people all over the world in sync with their hatred of everything I embody, rebel against the permanency of their untouchability, reviling everything that reminds them of centuries of collective humiliation, dehumanization, and a life entrenched in suffering. But I too have suffered. My gender, my feminine mystique, my voice from the lips that cannot speak have also been exploited, battered and forced into a deep slumberous silence. So now I often wonder, am I not broken too? 
I am a feminist in pieces, seeking to deconstruct that which I am, to reconstruct that which I think I should be. Willing to rage against the winds of resistance, I am a feminist carrying my pieces with heart and passion for a cause which I cannot even call my own. For a cause that they will not allow to be my own. Cast aside, raced aside, all this engendering has collapsed me, unraveled me, crippled me, left me as nebulous as I was before the union of my parents' spirits. But still I rise with my pieces in tow because I see how feminim, feminism replenishes me. I look forward to the day when my black mother draws me into the strength of her breast, when I am no longer just an alien buffalo soldier trudging forth past the red rock giants, and when this country of my skull accepts me as a woman without deference and reverence of Pativrata. A feminist in pieces, no more will I be. I will have transcended the chaos of three diasporas, three lives in three distinct women. My holy trinity will meld into one and I will finally be a feminist in peace, in one whole peace. Thank you ever so much, Smita, for this very gripping and moving piece. Uh, I'm sure uh, you know, we can talk about it endlessly, and we will later on. Thank you very much. Thank you. The student who will present her literary work is Rashmi Chaudhary. I had discovered her voice and her expressiveness in a number of uh, different uh, sessions in IIT where she presented her poetry. Uh, I think you yourself will discover it and see the kind of candor and power her voice has. Uh, I have requested her to introduce herself in Hindi, although I just do want to point out that uh, she is equally comfortable with English, but that's a second language, very clearly a second language, which she gradually picked up through textbooks and through college education, and now for her research is a vital part of her education. And she considers this second relationship as a vital element of her critical and creative awareness. So she doesn't really have an uncomfortable relationship with English language, though English, Hindi flows from her heart, soul, her context. So Rashmi, she will introduce herself. Namaskar. My name is Rashmi Chaudhary. I am a student in the world. और मेरे शोध का विषय प्रमुख रूप से मानसिक बीमारियों के ऊपर आधारित है हिंदी भाषा से मेरा बहुत गहरा संबंध रहा है क्योंकि हिंदी भाषा को मैंने बचपन से अपने घर परिवार की एक पहली भाषा के रूप में देखा है मेरे अनेक रचनाएं पत्र पत्रिकाओं में प्रकाशित हो चुकी हैं रेडियो और कवि सम्मेलनों के जरिए मुझे अपनी अभिव्यक्ति का प्रोत्साहन बराबर प्राप्त हुआ है जहाँ तक अंग्रेजी भाषा से मेरे संबंध की बात आती है तो अंग्रेजी प्राथमिक रूप से मेरी पाठ्य पुस्तकों और मेरे स्कूल कॉलेज की चार दीवारी तक ही सीमित रही किंतु इसका अर्थ ये नहीं है कि अंग्रेजी को मैंने किसी मजबूरी के चलते या फिर अंग्रेजी को सिर्फ उसी एक परिधि तक सीमित रखने की कोशिश की क्योंकि अंग्रेजी भाषा में एक बहुत बड़ा लाभ या एक बहुत बड़ा फायदा यूँ कहें कि आपको अनेक देशों की अनुवादित रचनाएँ अंग्रेजी में सुलभ हो जाती हैं तो इस एक जरिए से मुझे बहुत सारे देशों बहुत सारी संस्कृतियों को देखने और समझने का मौका मिला बहुत सारी संस्कृतियों में साहित्य को एक विस्तार देने का मौका मिला साहित्य की गहरी समझ रखने का मौका मिला जिसने कहीं ना कहीं साहित्य में या रचनात्मकता में भागीदारी की और कहीं ना कहीं जो आप बोलेंगे खाद पानी जो है मेरी रचनाओं में दिया है हिंदी साहित्य के अंतर्गत छायावाद से लेकर प्रमुख रूप से छायावाद से लेकर प्रगतिवाद तक की कविताओं से मैं बेहद प्रभावित रही हूं और आधुनिक हिंदी काव्य धारा में गजल से मेरा विशेष तौर पर लगाव रहा है हिंदी भाषा और अंग्रेजी भाषा की बात करें तो एक दुविधा जो मैं कहूंगी कि जब आप अभिव्यक्ति की बात करते हैं तो कहीं ना कहीं 
शब्दों का जो खजाना आपकी अपनी भाषा में आपको सुलभ होता है उसे आप कहीं ना कहीं खो देते हैं जब आप एक भाषा से दूसरी भाषा की ओर जाने लगते हैं लेकिन वहीं दूसरी ओर जब आप दूसरी भाषा को समझने का या फिर उसे आत्मसात करने की कोशिश करते हैं तो वही भाषा आपको अनेकानेक नई चीज़ों का विस्तार देने लगती है अनेकानेक नई समझ का विस्तार देने लगती है और चाहे आप चाहे हम किसी भी भाषा की बात करें चाहे हम किसी भी संस्कृति की बात करें एक कवि और लेखक के लिए हर नई भाषा हर नई संस्कृति का विस्तार हर नई समझ का विस्तार कहीं ना कहीं उसकी रचनात्मकता को अधिक गहराई प्रदान करता है ऐसा मेरा मानना है आज मैं आपके समक्ष अपने कुछ पसंदीदा कविताएं पेश कर रही हूँ आशा है आप सभी को पसंद आएगी अपनी कविताओं की शुरुआत मैं त्रिवेणी से करना चाहती हूँ और इससे पहले कि मैं अपनी लिखी कोई त्रिवेणी आपके समक्ष प्रस्तुत करूँ मैं आपको बताना चाहूँगी कि त्रिवेणी जो है वो मुख्य रूप से गुलजार की इजाद की हुई एक विधा है गुलजार जो है तीन शब्दों तीन पंक्तियों के एक मुक्तकी या एक छंद लिखते हैं और इस मुक्तकी की खासियत ये है कि इसकी तीनों पंक्तियाँ अपने आप में स्वतंत्र होती हैं अगर आप पहली पंक्ति और दूसरी पंक्ति में कोई तारतम्य नाम ही देख पाएँ तीसरी पंक्ति अपने आप में उसके सार को स्पष्ट कर देती है उदाहरण के लिए मैं आपके सम्मुख गुलजार की लिखी हुई एक त्रिवेणी प्रस्तुत करूंगी कभी कभी बाजार में यूं भी हो जाता है कभी कभी बाजार में यूं भी हो जाता है कीमत ठीक थी जेब में इतने दाम नहीं थे ऐसे ही एक वक्त मैं तुमको हार आया था तो इस त्रिवेणी में आप देखेंगे कि प्रथम पंक्ति जब आप कहते हैं कि कभी कभी बाजार में यूं भी हो जाता है द्वितीय पंक्ति कीमत ठीक थी जेब में इतने दाम नहीं थे तीसरी पंक्ति इसके सार को अपने आप अभिव्यक्त कर देती है कि आप एक रिश्ते की अंदर की भावनाओं या फिर उसके अंदर की दुविधा की या जटिलता की बात कर रहे हैं तो लीजिए प्रस्तुत हैं मेरी अपनी लिखी हुई कुछ त्रिवेणियाँ मेरी पहली त्रिवेणी इतला मेरे लफ्ज़ों की तलखियत महफूज रखो मेरे लफ्ज़ों की तलखियत महफूज रखो ये कोई गैर नहीं है ये कोई गैर नहीं है बल्कि तुम्हारे सच की ही नाजायज़ औलादे हैं मेरी दूसरी त्रिवेणी हादसा अंतस की गहराई में जो भी उपजा अंतस की गहराई में जो भी उपजा सारी नमी खरपतवार ने सोख ली जमीन बंजर न थी मगर बीज बाज हो गए अपनी लिखी हुई कविता आपके समुख प्रस्तुत कर रही हूँ जिसका शीर्षक है आपकी एक तलबगार ये कविता मुख्य रूप से किसी कवि या किसी लेखक या किसी कलाकार की अभिव्यक्ति पे होने वाले वाद विवादों या कहें कि बहस को जो है एक अभिव्यक्ति एक स्वर देती है मेरी आंखें तस्वीरों को सिर्फ देख के रुक नहीं सकती मेरी आंखें तस्वीरों को सिर्फ देख के रुक नहीं सकती मेरी उंगलियों के लिए उन्हें छूकर महसूस करना बेहद ज़रूरी है रंग शायद इसे मेरी हसत कहें मुझे बेवकूफ़ कहने की गलती भी की जा सकती है मगर मेरे लिए तस्वीरों का सिर्फ आँखों में अटक के रह जाना हवस है चंद लम्हों की मेरे लिए ज़रूरी है कि उन्हें लम्स के एहसास से ज़िंदा रखा जाए मेरी उंगलियाँ उन्हें सिर्फ छूती भर रही हैं मेरी उंगलियाँ उन्हें सिर्फ छूती भर नहीं हैं उन्हें उनके होने का एहसास दिलाती हैं उनके भीतर उग रही धीमी धीमी धड़कनों को रफ्तार देती हैं कभी कभी मुझे यूँ भी लगता है मुसविर इन्हें महज एक फ्रेम देता है कभी कभी मुझे यूँ भी लगता है कि मुसविर इन्हें महज एक फ्रेम देता है वो तो बस मैं हूँ जो इन सबको अपनी कोख में पाले घूम रही हूँ इस पर बहस मुबासे हैं इस पर कई सवाल व जवाब हैं इस पर कई झगड़े फसाद हैं इस पर कई ज़िंदगियों के सवाल अटके हुए हैं और मैं हैरान हो के बस ये सोच रही हूँ कि तुम्हें ये सब हक दिए किसने और आखिर में ये पेश है मेरी अपनी लिखी हुई गज़ल उम्मीद है आप सबको पसंद आएगी बस आई है जब से 
शहर रफ्ता रफ्ता बसाई है जब से शहर रफ्ता रफ्ता बिखरने लगे हैं ये घर रफ्ता रफ्ता बिखरने लगे हैं ये घर रफ्ता रफ्ता बसाई है जब से शहर रफ्ता रफ्ता बिखरने लगे हैं ये घर रफ्ता रफ्ता यारो शराफत बुरा रोग है पर यारो शराफत बुरा रोग है पर यारो शराफत बुरा रोग है पर क्यों होता है इसका असर रफ्ता रफ्ता क्यों होता है इसका असर रफ्ता रफ्ता वो दौड़ी है छूने फलक नीला नीला वो दौड़ी है छूने फलक नीला नीला वो दौड़ी है छूने फलक नीला नीला सिमटने लगे हैं शजर रफ्ता रफ्ता सिमटने लगे हैं शजर रफ्ता रफ्ता खबरदार जिस दिन से हम होंगे यारो खबरदार जिस दिन से हम होंगे यारो खबरदार जिस दिन से हम होंगे यारो वो हो जाएंगे बेअसर रफ्ता रफ्ता वो हो जाएंगे बेअसर रफ्ता रफ्ता है साजिश नए दौर के दुश्मनों की है साजिश नए दौर के दुश्मनों की है साजिश नए दौर के दुश्मनों की उतारेंगे खंजर मगर रफ्ता रफ्ता उतारेंगे खंजर मगर रफ्ता रफ्ता वो बच्ची थी कल तक जो अखबार है अब वो बच्ची थी कल तक जो अखबार है अब वो बच्ची थी कल तक जो अखबार है अब जमाने की बदली नजर रफ्ता रफ्ता जमाने की बदली नजर रफ्ता रफ्ता और गजल का आखिरी शेर है जला डाला जिसको घड़ी भर में तुमने जला डाला जिसको घड़ी भर में तुमने जला डाला जिसको घड़ी भर में तुमने बसाया था मन का नगर रफ्ता रफ्ता बसाया था मन का नगर रफ्ता रफ्ता सिमटने लगे हैं शसर रफ्ता रफ्ता बिखरने लगे हैं ये घर रफ्ता रफ्ता शुक्रिया वाह वाह बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया आपका रश्मि कि आपने अपना बिल्कुल प्रवाह हम लोगों को के साथ यू नो शेयर किया है और हम चाहेंगे कि आप रचनात्मकता में बड़ी बड़ी ऊंचाइयाँ ऊंचाइयों तक पहुँचें और हम इसी तरह आपको सुनते रहें धन्यवाद शुक्रिया बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया